Launched in 2019, the Coral Adventurer quickly established new benchmarks for expedition cruising. Brilliantly designed, the ship providing guest boarding for our historic 60-day circumnavigation of Australia, with an opportunity to explore remote wilderness areas, showcasing a side of the country previously inaccessible to most. Coral Expeditions Group General Manager Mark Fifield has been working on the voyage for over two years. The project was temporarily shelved during the COVID-19 pandemic. However, with strong passenger interest, coupled with the passion shown by the company's shore team, Mark was always confident the organisation would provide guests with the trip of a lifetime. We sat around the boardroom and said, what are we going to do differently? And uh, the concept of going around Australia was thrown on the table and uh, we, we debated whether we were going to do that in, in segments and we thought, no, well, let's, let's do something totally different and just put it out there as a 59 night and, uh, and it's got to be a unique experience to go right around Australia in, a, in an expedition ship, never been done before and, uh, and uh, here we were. On the 17th of October, the Coral Adventurer set out from Cairns with 108 passengers aboard Captain Matthew Fryer and his bridge crew preparing for a nighttime trek along the North Queensland coastline towards Cooktown. With just 60 staterooms available, those on board will be treated to an intimate and personal voyage of discovery. The circumnavigation, a celebration of Australia, Indigenous culture and our maritime history. We offer a high class product, but it's a very laid back Australian style. So all our ships are designed for the tropics. We've got big open decks, open spaces, um, very casual sort of settings. Um, we have really, I guess, casual lounges that we convert into lectures. All of our crew are Australian. They, they converse with the guests um, you know, on, you know, on a personal level. Um, and yeah, we just do it the Australian way. So there's no, there's no jackets, there's no ties, there's no real formalities. Um, but we just do it with quality, but without flashiness. First light on day two, the earliest of risers are treated to a glimpse of Cooktown, located on the eastern coast of Cape York Peninsula. While home to local Indigenous peoples for thousands of years prior, Captain James Cook and his crew, including botanist Sir Joseph Banks, land in 1770, marking the beginning of a significant change for the region. Guest lecturer Ian Morris is one of a handful of subject experts aboard the Coral Adventurer, providing a level of historical detail which gives real meaning to the locations and sites the passengers are exploring. Very little known, most Aussies are not taught much about the North Australian coastline. So yeah, our job was to uh, stimulate the guests and, and tell them how important all these various places were in our human history as well as for our natural history. The museum up the side of the hill certainly looks into the indigenous side of, of the Australian human history and the history of this area. But it's interesting because the Indigenous people here are very proud of Captain Cook and his interaction with them and he was quite impressed with them and you'll read it in his writings, in his uh, handwritten journals, and some of which are on the wall up here. For expedition leader Cara Kavanagh, having zoologist, educator, conservationist and author Ian Morris on the circumnavigation adds an invaluable and exciting new aspect to each day. Having Ian Morris on board is like having a living encyclopedia. There isn't much about the East Coast and the top end of Australia that Ian doesn't know. Um, he connects people with uh, history, with culture and uh, with flora and fauna. He's just such a well-rounded um, individual and it's such a pleasure to have him on board. The guests are really um, luck and fortunate to get all Ian's knowledge and uh, the way he puts it across is really easy to, to listen to. The Coral Adventurer's voyage along the far north Queensland coastline sees the anchor dropped at Lizard Island. 
It's the guests' first opportunity to swim in a remote area of the Great Barrier Reef, teeming with coral species and marine life. Let's just go through our signals. If we asked if you're okay, what do you say? You're okay. Cool, if you want a taxi, you want to pick up. Cool, and if we get to get you in a hurry. Ah! With passengers of various ages and mobility on board, safety and inclusion are of the highest priority for Kara and her team. Part of my role on board is to be in touch with the guests. I am you know, the face of the expeditions, uh, but I'm also uh, there to interact with the guests and, and kind of monitor how they're feeling because there's a range of different uh, levels on board here and what one guest might you know, be interested in is not necessarily the same for all. So. Um, yeah, it's part of my role is to kind of make sure we're meeting all needs and, uh, you know, really maximising individual experiences for our guests. These days, Lizard Island serves as a popular destination for marine enthusiasts, scientists and tourists from around the globe. The area also home to a small research station which supports scientific investigations into the Great Barrier Reef's ecology, providing a platform for studying the impacts of climate change, coral bleaching and other environmental changes. As the sun rises on day four, guests are preparing to visit another UNESCO World Heritage Site with the anchor dropped off Osprey Reef, a submerged atoll. For Captain Matthew Fryer, it's the detailed design and fit out of the Coral Adventurer, which makes it possible to take the ship into areas previously inaccessible to passenger vessels, allowing them to explore and experience firsthand the delicate ecosystems and pristine coral reefs. The Coral Adventurer is a purpose-built expedition vessel designed for just that expedition style cruising. Um, so in her design, she has a shallow draft, which allows her to access remote locations that are often unaccessible by a more conventional style of vessel. Um, she's very maneuverable, she's designed that way. That again, assists in that function of being an effective expedition cruising vessel. And there's other things that go along with that that stand in with the principles of the company, such as her efficiency. Uh, so she's designed in such a way that we have as minimal environmental impact as possible and her services and systems all back up that style that she's designed for of getting into remote areas, spending extended time away from uh, major ports and places where we have you know, good resources. So she's designed to be out and um, away from what you would say is conventional supplies, so to speak. Biodiversity hotspot Stanley Island is next stop on the east coast leg of the trek. The area's seagrass beds supporting a number of vulnerable species, including dugongs, sea turtles and migratory birds. Nearby Stanley Island is also steeped in cultural and spiritual importance with precious indigenous artworks providing intricate detail and stories about clan connection which have been passed down through generations. First contact with the European explorers are also precious moments in time which have been captured on cave walls. Very good. Okay, 
They were long before my grandfather's, I reckon. Because my grandfather's only painted these ones here. These guys in the 40s. I think the other ones were long before him. Just like the artwork adorning the cave walls, the landscape is as it was centuries ago, when First Nations people survived by hunting on the land and fishing the pristine waters. Ian Morris confident the experience of stepping shore on the islands which dot Northern Australia and seeing and hearing about the region's history will have a profound and lasting impact on those fortunate enough to experience it. I think Australians are getting more and more conscious of the fact that they weren't given a very good background in our Indigenous Australian history, the first Australians. Uh, I know it surprises a lot of people to find out that they've been here for so long in, in Australia and, and have been managing this country rather well for what the Department of Prehistory ANU tells us is about 80,000 years but they can guarantee 65,000 years of constant human occupation. Most Aussies that's uh, a bit hard to kind of process but um, we try to show them, our guests on this coastline, just how much the people here are locked into, I guess, the landscape as humans and, and how much, I guess, personal feeling they have for their own country. Uh, it's like an empathy with the land. You, you, you eat turtles and you eat dugong and things like that but you also have an empathy for those animals and for their populations. And if you're a good human, you will ensure that those populations continue. And that's something we Westerners don't have. It's been another busy day for passengers and crew, with Captain Matthew Fryer pleased the team have once again delivered a number of unique experiences. 59 night cruise that we're on at the moment is obviously the longest cruise that Coral has ever done. And it's probably one of the longest expedition style cruises in the world on offer. Um, obviously in that sense it's unique. I mean the itinerary and the idea of circumnavigating Australia is exciting, both for myself and the guests. I know a lot of crew have been looking forward to this cruise in itself. The unique side of this is having the Explorer tenders are a huge part of um, the product that we give to the guests at the end of the day. One of the things that I guess uh, is a standout for Coral is that we're able to take low mobility guests and put them in places that I guess they would otherwise be unable to access without facilities like the Explorers. The advantage of being able to board them at deck level is huge. The access from the bow door is significant as well in enabling us to get guests from a range of demographics onto the remote beaches, up the remote rivers, and to see things that otherwise wouldn't be accessible. This is a Restoration Island. It was named by uh, soon to be Governor Bly, William Bly, after, his, uh, the, after the mutiny of the bounty. Restoration Island has a fascinating history, the area visited by renowned explorer William Bly on several occasions. In fact, William Bly was one of the first Europeans to meticulously document the island's flora and fauna, along with the indigenous cultures he encountered. It was during his visits to the island that Bly gained detailed insights into the local indigenous peoples, traditional practices and cultural heritage. For local Dave Glasheen and his pup Polly, Restoration Island is home and the arrival of the coral adventurer means fresh supplies and some company. Yeah, well, Captain Bly is just where he landed, eh? And after the mutiny on the bounty. So according to the journal, he only stayed here one full day, which I don't think was true, but, but yeah, he came here on a Saturday afternoon, wrote the prayer book under a coconut tree, and then the, half the men were in the boat and half were on the land. And the locals were over there waving spears and things, but no canoe. So, and they took off the following day, according to the journal, but they would have been half dead, these people. I've got some creature comforts, but when you run out of booze, it's a bit hard. <laughs> but, you know, you learn to you, you appreciate water, you know, and the things you, you do have, you know. 
Even in these remote waters, sadly pollution is a problem and annually the island's inhabitants remove more than two tonnes of plastic waste from the beach, rubbish which has been discarded or come loose from passing ships. That noise. For Ian Morris, every step taken, every plant and animal spotted, reveals another secret to Australia's maritime history, shedding more light on how Indigenous Australians survived and thrived for so long. This is what we call uh, monsoon forest, which is kind of deciduous. So if you look at a lot of the trees now, they're just firing up because we've had, David said the first decent rain was last night. While for passengers each day aboard the Coral Adventurer is a smooth schedule of well-organised expeditions and events, for Mark Fifield and the ship's crew, it's the result of a meticulously planned journey designed to deliver a unique and exclusive experience. What we wanted to do is we, I mean, I guess we're Australian flagged and Australian, yeah, we're an Australian culture, so, and all, most of our clientele, Australian based, was trying to deliver a product for our Australian guests who are looking to travel in the style that we offer. Um, and um, yeah, as, as we expanded, it was where can we go that we can't get to or nobody else has been to. So we're really the pioneers of many of the itineraries through the region. Thank you, guys. Thank okay. you for having us at your okay. Farmer Island, part of the Piper Islands National Park, is the next excursion destination, home to an abundance of migratory birds, crocodiles and sea turtles. So different parts of this itinerary, I mean, it's a big lap around Australia, 60 days, so over the next few days we're going to be experiencing remote reefs, uh, pristine water and uh, lots of marine life. So this part of the itinerary, I'm really trying to maximise our amount of time in the water and uh, you know, getting people as uh, up and close as I can to these unique remote reef systems. Throughout the 1890s, the pearl shell industry was thriving across the Torres Strait, with global demand for buttons and cutlery handles, seeing the building of pearl shell collecting stations across the region. The pearl rush also establishing Torres Strait Islanders as skilled pearl divers and traders. A great area. Um, and of course Cape York is a migratory pathway for many things including paradise kingfishes. The isolated and remote Turtle Head Island, named by William Bly in 1789, is crucial to the world's maritime ecosystems. The water's home to various turtle species, including the endangered green and loggerhead turtles, who use the area as a breeding ground. This is Turtle Head Island. It's quite a big island. If you look up that way, you can see two headlands. That's the top of the island. This is the only settlement on the island. You came in Escape River and you've been up Escape River. This is Middle River. You go around there, around the corner and through the mangroves about an hour and you come out to Bamaga.
A sunset drink on the northernmost tip of Australia is another highlight on the first leg of the expedition. The ship's fleet of explorers providing access to one of Australia's most remote locations. One, two, three. three. First chartered by Captain James Cook, Thursday Island became the centrepiece for trade across northern Australia, with sailors visiting the tropical islands from around the globe. So we're going to do a cultural tour. We'll go to the cultural centre. It is a little bit of a walk up there um, and we'll be walking back. We're going to have some free time afterwards as well. We might have an hour free time, uh, but we need to be back here at quarter past three. Okay, that's the last boat. Today, Thursday Island remains a vibrant reflection of its multicultural heritage. The islanders have maintained many of their cultural traditions and connection to the land and sea. T.I. Truly is a melting pot of art, music, cultural traditions and dance practices with locals preserving a unique way of life. The lighthouse on nearby Booby Island, as the coral adventurer prepares for another night at sea, was built in 1890, following a loss of a number of merchant ships on the surrounding reefs. Life-saving supplies were also stored on the island, providing some hope to those able to scramble up the rocky shores. After crossing the Gulf of Carpentaria during the night, passengers wake up on the Gove Peninsula, with its rugged, unforgiving coastline and crystal clear waters home to the Yolongu people for thousands of years. <laughs> Yolongu local I mean, and onboard guest lecturer Go Gondara guides passengers through their Northern Territory expeditions, discussing complex kinships, indigenous history, bush food and connection to country. If you look at Yolongu kinship, it's very, 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 very complex, very hard for a Bolanda person to understand the system of kinship and how we relate to each other and, and the land and the animals and everything that surrounds us. So in the Yolngo way, it's, uh, we Yolngo understand because we basically, we learn it and we live, live it, we live uh, kinship, and that's how we understand each other, but it's, it's very, very complex for, for Balanda people, non-Indigenous people, to understand your kinship and how we are connected to each other and the land. Importantly, Goma is one of the first ever Yongla people to cruise on a ship and share their culture. First of all, I feel really really not not i can't say it lucky but really really good because uh i get to share one of the oldest cultures in the world to um Balanda people uh especially australians uh white australians who don't know much about yongo culture and how important it is to us as Yolngu people. So when I do this trip, I want to share more about what it means to be a Yolngu and what it means to have my culture shared to Balanda people on this ship. Gove continues to play a vital role in Australia's economy and resource sector with its extensive bauxite deposits and aluminium refinery, a cornerstone of industry in the region. For the locals of Northwest Arnhem Land, visits by ships like the Coral Adventurer provide an important opportunity to share their art, culture and history. A visit to the Yirikala Art Centre provides a rare opportunity to watch as ancient art forms and natural materials are blended with more contemporary printing techniques. But because a lot of the artists had used um, razor blades to incise into wood, 
into some of the carvings, we thought, well, that's a, a nice transition. Let's start with the liner cutting because with the liner cutting, you can um, you can see here the the liner is blank. So then the artist will work out their design, and then they will cut into the lino to make these grooves. So now, when the artists come in, they prefer to use the, the, the lino tools, because it's a, a technique that people have become familiar with using those tools. Day 12 with the coral adventurer anchored offshore, passengers journey along a nearby channel in Explorers, stepping off on Bathurst Island, an island which holds a significant cultural importance to those who call the Tiwi Islands home. Today the locals continue to embrace their traditions and celebrate their heritage, making Bathurst Island an important centre for Indigenous art and cultural preservation. You welcome you to a beautiful place, the Tiwi Island. Hopefully, in the next few minutes, we'll be in, uh, looking at different things and for you guys to experience the culture and everything and hope this will be a good day and for everyone. One of the most captivating aspects of Bathurst Island's indigenous culture are the traditional smoking ceremonies, which hold a deep spiritual significance. These ceremonies, known as yoi in the Tiwi language, are performed on various occasions to cleanse and purify individuals and the surrounding environment. Back on deck, head chef Dylan Hodgins has been preparing the highly anticipated barbecue night on the Vista Deck. The evening's meal, of course, featuring a number of local delicacies. Creating the menu on board the Coral Adventurer is a complex process with meals planned up to two weeks in advance, with head chef Dylan and his team managing fresh produce to ensure stores are utilised in relation to their shelf life, and passengers enjoy the very best food and produce from the various areas the ship passes. A lot of the fish will change along the way, uh, mostly the seafood, the meat tends to say the same, like obviously you have your beef and your lamb, it might come from different regions, but the fish that, um, because Australia is so big and the water temperatures change, you know, we might have one fish here and then when we go down to Tasmania, you know, we might be sourcing different uh, types of fish. As we go through Darwin, down to Frio, we might have some prawns from the Gulf. Um, and yeah, I think that when the guests see this on the menu, you know, they can come up and ask me and you know, see where it's from or it might be written on the menu and they just want to uh, know more about the, the produce and I can give them that, that insight. There's understandably additional excitement as the city of Darwin appears on the horizon, with passengers and crew aware the first leg of the circumnavigation is coming to an end, but not before the first of the journey's special events have been experienced. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. It is now time for us to start disembarkation for our Uluru excursion. Ladies and gentlemen, we will be disembarking from deck five. We do ask that you bring your face mask uh, it would be appropriate to wear the mask on the bus uh, and the aeroplane. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, we are expecting it to be cool this evening, so please pack a jacket and also be prepared uh, for isolated showers. Remember, we are taking that walk to the Mutajulu waterhole, so walking shoes would be appropriate. Now, ladies and gentlemen, please bring your water bottles. Now, this is a 15-minute call for Group A. 
Group B will be disembarked after another announcement. Uluru springs majestically out of the vast red desert, shooting 350 metres into the sky. The sandstone monolith, a magnet for tourists around the world. On any other occasion, the appearance of rain clouds would most certainly put a dampener on the day's activities. However, out here in the desert, the rare occurrence of rain on the rock is something to be celebrated. The desert comes alive. Vibrant wildflowers burst into bloom, adorning the landscape with a kaleidoscope of colours. If you're not sure what the art looks like at Kakadu, it's a lot more intricate. You've got the, um, the x-ray art showing the inner workings of animals, uh, but obviously, quite different to this. This was used as a blackboard and as a tool. There's areas around Uluru and Katajuda that are only for men or only for women. Some of them are shared areas. And this is one of those places. So this was a family cave and an education cave. <coughs> those frogs are so loud. Isn't that cool? Oh, I've never heard them that loud before. A dinner comprising of brilliantly prepared and presented traditional bush tucker caps off a memorable excursion. Poached prawn with an aioli based sauce. Passengers and crew then return to the coral adventurer, preparing to set sail for the west coast of Australia. So one of the things we wanted to do is really have an opportunity to experience a number of really special events and things that people ordinarily wouldn't do. So one. Uh, um, so as we worked through those, one of those was the uh, uh, we, we chartered a private uh, commercial jet um, to Uluru, did a scenic flight around the rock, maybe a couple of times, landed and had dinner there at Uluru under the stars, um, and, uh, and then really finished that up and ended up back on the ship that evening.